Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. And as we always do, we are working to bring wildly cool and inspiring and intriguing ideas to you. Hopefully that will inspire you to share the kinds of things that you learn as a part of your experience, not just with this program, but perhaps across our entire meeting. Uh, if you are not a Rotarian, and if you're like, what's a Rotarian? Then that would mean, no, you're not a Rotarian. Rotarians are members of Rotary International, a worldwide organization of over 1.2 million people in 33, 34,000 clubs uh, that get together uh, in their local little space or in our online international space, as it turns out, in order to figure out ways to make the world a better place. And so one of the ways that our club, the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, does this is by bringing fantastic speakers into a space where we can share so as to allow folks to not just experience good ideas, but for Rotarians to be able to make up misses in their own club, because our club is so crazy flexible. That's just kind of who we are. Our speaker today is, is Andrew Vandenhoyle. And this guy is interesting on so many fronts, it's hard to know where to get started. But he and I have known each other through the ed tech space, educational technology world realm, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he does lots and lots of work to find ways to inspire uh, young people to see new possibilities in their learning, has a special passion for astronomy, and recently did some wonderful work as a part of a, a webinar that, uh, that I helped host called Activities Across Grade Levels. And this is, I believe, Andrew, your first time to visit the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, and we are jazzed to have you, and I hand the mic over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Russian. And you've said such, you know, you, Russian's been telling me such wonderful things about this group. So it is an honor to be here and to share with you a little bit. Um, let me uh, share my screen and kind of, uh, we'll, get, we'll get rolling. So here we go. You guys see that all right? I'm gonna trust that you can. So the topic I'd like to share with you today is the state of the universe. So I am passionate about lots of things. I'm passionate about technology. I'm passionate about education. Uh, and I'm an online teacher, those things blend together, but I'm also passionate about the universe and astronomy. And when I say the universe, I mean, I mean everything, right? Uh, everything here on earth, everything out in space. And so my hope in chatting with you about the state of the universe today is to give you a sense of like what exciting things are happening and how really not just like a summary of the exciting things, but sort of a context for how, to, how excited you should be getting about things as they happen. And um, and I wanna, I wanna kind of start with that context actually. And I don't know if, if you find this, but I, I have a master's in astronomy and I find this, I can't make heads or tails of astronomy news. I, I see these are just from the past few days, right? So there's a story in the news about a new planet that's discovered around a really bright star. Well, that should be exciting, I think. And there's a new black hole that's wandering through space. And it seems like every day there's another asteroid that is just barely missing the earth. And, Honestly, it's kind of overwhelming and it can't be that all of this is like so critically important, right? It's impossible that every day there's just like some insanely critical new discovery that's happening. And so I actually think it's, it's important for us to step back and consider the nature of science itself as we consider what is really important and what's maybe not quite as important. And so here's just a, a I want to, I want to take this quick detour to like uh, understanding the nature of science. This is how many people understand the nature of science or that they're taught that what it's like is that is that there's this giant pile of facts and, and what the scientist does is they take their shovel o science and they go over to the universe and they, they dislodge another fact. Maybe it's a new black hole that they discover and they throw it in the pile or it's a new planet they discover. Or it's a new something that they uncover and they just throw it into the pile. This way of understanding the nature of science is, is not actually accurate, uh, which probably doesn't surprise you, but is also not very helpful. And what is more helpful is using the language of model making. And so instead what we talk about is, is scientists examine the universe and they build models. And in some instances, those models are incredibly accurate. They follow every little dip and curve. In other cases, we kind of know that they're approximations and they're, they could be better. And in other places, we just have like, no clue, like we're, we have pretty decent guesses, but really we're, we're a long ways from fully understanding. And so I would like to submit to you that those most important discoveries, the ones we should really be paying attention to and the ones that sort of de define our current state of the universe in terms of how we understand the universe around us 
are those discoveries that either, you know, sort of close the gap on these models, like kind of fill in these gaps or that blow whole new wide open gaps in our model, just blow it wide open so that we realize there's so much more to discover. Um, so I would say those, those discoveries we're seeing in the news every day are more like little tiny pieces that are kind of already in the well understood and well defined parts of our, of our models. And I wanna share with you, uh, not, not only this, but as a, as a way of kind of looking to the future of like, when, it, when are those discoveries that really matter? What, how do we look for them? I just also want to highlight just because, you know, Russian and I overlap in this interest in education that this, this attitude towards the nature of science also impacts the way we approach education. When we view science as this collection of facts, then we treat students as though what they need to do is climb this pile of facts so that they can then maybe get that shovel of science someday and add their own little piece to the pile. Right. And of course, as we all know, most students don't get to the top of that pile, but they fall off at some point along the way and leave with a terrible impression of what science is all about. And so the way we should really be approaching science education is something I'm passionate about, is that students themselves can examine the universe, observe the universe and build their own models, right? And those models are not as sophisticated as what the scientists are building, but they're doing the practice of science just the same way that scientists are doing that practice. All right, so what I wanna do is kind of take a step back and look at a couple examples of how uh, our models of the universe have been revolutionized in history. Just a really quick summary so you get a sense of what I'm talking about and then show some more recent examples. And by recent, I mean like the past 50 years because these things don't happen every year and they don't even happen every decade. Um, and so some of this may be familiar to you but I hope you're seeing this in a new way uh, in light of this context. So some quick examples from history would be, you know, understanding how, how disease is spread, right? And, and the revolutionary understanding that germ theory led to, or the Copernican revolution, right? This dramatic displacement of earth to not the center of the universe, right? That's a huge revolution in our, in our model. The development of the atomic model, how everything is made along the way. And uh, another example, general relativity replacing universal gravitation. Um, I, I wanna highlight here though, like, as a physics major and a, uh, someone who got their master's in astronomy, I have never even taken a course in general relativity. It is so sophisticated, so specialized that, you know, to be honest with you, you just don't need it in like 99% of situations. And it highlights, I think, something which is interesting about all of these models and models in general is that just because a model is old, like even the bad air, you know, model. It doesn't mean it's wrong or not useful. You know, if you consider, if your model of how disease is transferred is that there's somehow bad air, you know, that you can't breathe, you know, one way you might prevent disease is to wear masks, right, to somehow filter the bad air. And it's striking to note that that, that would have probably worked in the age of coronavirus, right? Even if our model was, was bad, it wasn't that bad. Um, and the same could be said of Copernican revolution. The reason this was so hard for astronomers to figure out is because both the Ptolemaic and the Copernican models actually predicted the exact same locations of planets in the night sky. It was only when Galileo applied new technology of a telescope to the phases of Venus that these two models began to break down and we saw evidence supporting the Copernican model. So just because a model's old, it actually can be very useful. And we see that especially in the case of gravity where we still teach all our students Newton's gravity, universal gravitation, because it works and it's particularly useful. Other examples, I mean, I, I could go on and on because there's, there's lots of amazing examples of revolutionary discoveries, but I wanna focus on more recent ones that you may have heard of, but maybe don't quite know why they were so revolutionary. Um, so I'm gonna focus on, on two in particular, two of these kind of like dotted lines in our model. The first one is a story that goes back to the early 1970s and this astronomer who's Vera Rubin and she actually had been working on some controversial areas of, uh, as far as astronomy goes, controversial areas of research and decided to do something less controversial. And so she started measuring the rotation of galaxies to better understand how they, how they move. And unfortunately she discovered something that ended up being quite controversial in its own right. And so here's, here's the idea of how galaxies move on the left. This is what's expected. And this is goes down, back to Newton's gravitation. If you have a concentration of stuff in the center of this galaxy that's rotating, you would expect things farther out to actually rotate slower. 
And that's what this graph shows on the bottom. You have velocity on the vertical axis and then distance out from the center of the galaxy, things should be moving slower and slower. We see that in our own solar system where there's a concentration of mass in the center, the sun, planets that are far out, they're just moving more slowly. It's just, it comes right out of Newton's equations for gravity. What Vera discovered was that galaxies don't rotate like that. Instead, what they rotate is with a common speed all the way around the galaxy. That is to say, stars towards the middle of the galaxy are moving at more or less the same speed as stars on the outer edges of the galaxy. And just like students or just like kiddos on a, on a merry-go-round spinning really, really fast, these stars on the outer edges of the galaxy should be flying out of the galaxy. The whole galaxy should be flying apart. The only way that it can be held in this kind of rotation is if there's far more material inside the galaxy that's holding it together than what we see in the stars. And that is where this idea of dark matter comes from. And I, 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 can't, under, I can't overstate how, how revolutionary that idea is, the idea of dark matter. Um, it is like mind bendingly crazy and it's not just through galactic rotation curves. There actually have been no less than 10 independent methods that have confirmed the presence of dark matter. But each of these were indirect, each of these are indirect methods. We've never actually detected a dark matter particle. And so physicists and astronomers still don't know exactly what a dark matter particle is, even though we can see its influence through gravity on ordinary matter. Today, it has yet been undiscovered. So even though it's sort of in the zeitgeist, everybody knows about it, it is a, a commonly described phenomenon as sort of being mysterious. There's active ongoing physics projects. Usually they involve abandoned mines, miles beneath the surface of the earth um, to detect actual dark matter particles. And so when you're seeing news in physics and astronomy, that's the kind of news that I'm paying attention to is what kind of progress is being made to solve this mystery of what is this dark matter. Uh, it's particularly challenging because if you consider all the physical matter in the universe, dark matter accounts for 84% of that matter. So when we think about the model that a scientist have been building to describe all the universe, the chemistry, the biology, the physics, everything, it's really only been talking about 16% of what is even out there in, in the universe. And that's very challenging, uh, considering how incomplete all this work we've been doing seems to be. It's worth noting that Vera Rubin was never awarded the Nobel Prize for her discovery. And there's an interesting Atlantic article that's linked here. And she has since passed away. And so she can never be awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, which is a noteworthy omission for an extremely important discovery. This is a, the, the next discovery I want to share with you is along the same vein, and this is one I got to experience personally, which is unusual, again, because, you know, you know, I'm not that old, and these discoveries don't happen that often. But in the mid-1990s, and when I first started reading astronomy books, this is what I saw uh, when we we're talking about how the universe changes, this cosmology, how the universe changes at the largest scales. And what we were told at that time was that there's basically three possible models for how our universe is expanding. So we know the universe is expanding thanks to lots of different astronomers' contributions uh, of measuring the expansion of the universe, galaxies receding from each other, moving away. But what we didn't know and don't know is what, what happens then uh, later on? Are these galaxies, right? We have this mass from all these galaxies pulling on each other. That's going to slow the expansion. And so is it going to pull, is all that, is, it basically boils down to, is there enough stuff in the universe that it's going to pull all these galaxies back together and they're going to come back down like the pink curve shows? The size of the universe is actually going to contract again and the whole universe will re-collapse? That's one possibility. The red curve shows a possibility where the universe will slow in its expansion because of all this gravity and eventually reach kind of a constant size. And the third possibility that was described is that the universe will slow in its expansion, but continue expanding forever. This was sort of considered, I would say, common knowledge. It was in popular level, popular level, level books. It was in uh, textbooks. One problem, of course, is you can't look into the future. You can't look ahead and say, like, how, which, which of these universes do we live in? Um, but what astronomers can do is look into the past because we can look into very distant galaxies on the farthest edges of the universe. Uh, and that light has been traveling to us for billions of years. And so we can 
actually zoom in on this part of the curve and look for small changes between these two models and, and compare what, are, what does the universe actually look like in its very earliest years, uh, you know, just a few hundred million years after, after the Big Bang. And we can compare that data to these models to actually make some predictions. Now I have these crude hand-drawn illustrations, but I can show you um, what the scientists actually found. Because in 1998, uh, these three scientists, Saul Permuter, Brian Schmidt, and Adam Rees, observed uh, these supernovas, some of the most distant objects ever observed in, in very distant galaxies, in order to measure uh, effectively the size of the universe and determine which of these models is correct. So here's my crude hand drawing. This is more like what a professional would look at on the right-hand side. And you can see what I discovered as a, a late teenager uh, and what astronomers discovered was a true shock. And, and that was that the three models that astronomers considered as possible are shown in the professional curve there as, as uh, pink and red and blue, right? Uh, dark blue, but that there really are a variety of models. I mean, these models depend on certain parameters that you could change the value to, to anything. So what, I, what was presented as three models could really be 15 different models if you're choosing different values. Well, what the astronomers found is that their data points, these black, these black and, and uh, light colored dots, actually correspond to a totally different model, uh, one that no one was really expecting. And that is that the universe is not even slowing, but is in fact accelerating in its expansion. And so it revealed at the time that there was an unexpected, uh, so, uh, the, the data was pointing to a very different model, one in which the universe is not slowing because of mutual gravity, or if it is for a time, there is an acceleration which then takes over and propels the universe outward. Of course, that poses like a real problem because just like it takes a, a force to propel anything on earth to, to an acceleration, it takes some form of energy to propel the universe into this kind of acceleration. And this is what gives rise to this idea of dark energy. This is, we call it dark energy because we don't really know what it is, the energy that is causing the universe to accelerate in its expansion. And um, the challenge is like, if you recall your E equals MC squared, this idea that energy and mass are somehow two sides of the same coin, we can start to say, let's represent all the mass energy of the universe, right, as a pie chart, in which case dark matter takes up a very large swath of it. it you know, it's, it's, it's 80 something percent of all physical matter. But if you consider the mass energy, dark energy is actually a huge, the predominant factor of, of what our universe is made up of. And the things that are familiar to us, like ordinary matter on the periodic table, only represents this small wedge of 5%. 4% of that is just hydrogen and helium. And the rest of it are the things we're more familiar with, like stars or heavier elements, which would include planets and things like us. So we're led to this insane realization that the model that all scientists had been working on, right? As of the uh, late 90s, we learned that the universe we're describing is 20 times more, uh, <laughs> contains 20, 20 times more stuff um, than, the, than what we are actually uh, studying and interacting with. So, so where does this leave us? So, so, so the three of these gentlemen received the Nobel Prize in 2011, just 13 years after their discovery. And if you go through the list of recent um, uh, uh, Nobel Prize award winners, you find other amazing stories of discovery, stories that I would love to share with you that you could read about. And, and some of those discoveries are, were, were accidental and unexpected and, and led to some really new challenges to existing models, like a, especially the discovery of the first extrasolar planets. Um, others of these discoveries though are more the product of carefully planned searches and they just reinforce the models that we already, that we already had. Um, but the two that I shared with you today, which undoubtedly were at least somewhat familiar represented such a revolution in, in the very fabric of what our universe is made out of that I, uh, I just, when Russian said sharing, sharing like the most important discoveries of the past 10 years, I, I was like, I have to look back 50 years and I have to share these two enormously important discoveries. So uh, that's what I wanted to share with you guys. <laughs> I hope it was somewhat interesting, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have.
Fantastic. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the folks on the call. If uh, people would be willing to turn their cameras on, we can get some waves when I introduce you. So in Hawaii, Susan and Melissa from the Rotary E-Club of Hawaii. And also in Hawaii, Vicki Toyama. Vicki, thank you for joining us. From the Rotary Club of Eugene Metropolitan in Oregon, Heather Edwards. Our guest speaker, uh, Andrew Vandenheuvel. And from our club, we have Rory in Texas, Shags in California, Ferheen in California, Phil in California, and Cecilia in California, plus me, Rushton, in California. All right, so let, let's jump into the questions. The first one that came in is one from Cecilia, uh, and she added it to the chat. So how does dark matter relate to black holes? Sorry, forgot to unmute. So great question. And, and uh, it would relate in if, if I were to share my screen one more time here, which I will do because it it is a common thought that like, well, black holes are dark. They don't give off light, right? So that's what dark matter must be. Um, and it's worth noting that in uh, in this part of the slide here where it shows dark matter being a significant part of the structure of the universe, black holes would fit into this 0.5%, right? They are being accounted for when we when we are thinking and talking about stars themselves. So the number of black holes in the universe, while the exact number, you know, is not something where you could be like there's 418 black holes, you know, we uh, understand very well how stars evolve and how they change. And so, uh, so it is when we talk about dark matter, it is in addition to ordinary matter. And you know, another another way of illustrating that is these, these independent methods for measuring dark matter. Some of them involve whole collisions between clusters of galaxies. And so these, um, it's gonna get more technical. Why don't I not say that? <laughs> Why don't I not say that? <laughs> cool. Now, one of the things that from the last 20 years that the people that certainly made the news was the demoting of Pluto from being a planet. I'm, I'm curious what, you know, what, we're, what we know about planets and, and planet-like objects in our solar system. So, so what kinds of things have we learned over the last couple of decades about the difficulty, perhaps, of identifying something and calling it a planet? Maybe there's a very simple definition. Help us out there. Yeah, you know, in my view, uh, we're talking about basically scientist definitions. You know what I mean? It's like Pluto didn't change. Um, and, and so the, to me, there's, it's not as foundational or fundamental or as interesting even as other discoveries that are made. I think to what's, what's interesting is the ongoing discovery of other Pluto-like objects in the outer solar system. And so the demotion of Pluto ultimately be, being due to the fact that there's just too many planets otherwise. If Pluto can be a planet, then all these other things should be planets. But ultimately it comes down to this, the challenge we have of putting things in boxes as scientists, right? Is how do we categorize things? How do we define things? And sometimes we have to draw somewhat arbitrary boundaries between things to categorize them. And, and that's really, I think, where the definition of a, a planet comes, com, comes down. Um, nonetheless, I think discoveries in the solar system are like fascinating. We have these amazing uh, explore, you know, missions, exploring the sources and taking images in, in incredible detail. I think like, what, would, what should I say? I, I noticed in the chat, there was a, a question about our emphasis on Mars. And I think Mars captures the attention of, of the public, right? Because it feels like this place we can, it, I mean, it really, it's one of the only places you could stand in the, in the solar system without dying immediately. Right. So like our, there's only so many places we can dream about going to. Uh, and Mars is, is really one of the, really one of the only ones. And yet I feel like, you know, we're how many times do I need to read about like a new place that we maybe found water on Mars? It just feels like like there's a narrative that just keeps getting repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, and yet the physics is pretty clear about like how what what happens to water on Mars. I mean, if you pull up Rushton saw this, but if you just go to Mars.google.com you can see a Google map version of the surface of Mars. If you spend two minutes looking at that, you will see river channels. I mean, you just look at it and like, you don't have to be a geologist. You just see river channels across the surface. You're like, sure looks like there used to be water there. Um, so, so, so I, you know, I'm maybe I'm a little pessimistic about like how many times 
but 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 sometimes like these are the things that are necessary to get people excited about um, about the you know that's not why the scientists are sending another robotic mission to Mars, right? It's very technical um, measurements and discoveries that they're making. Yeah. Nice. Farheen has a question. Farheen, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Andrew, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, as a fellow science nerd and space nerd, I really enjoyed it. Um, when, yeah, when the Mars rover landed, I was like in tears because I'm like, oh, yeah, it does, you know. Um, so thank you for your presentation. And yeah, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, Katie Bowman's work in developing the algorithm that created the first ever image of a black hole. Um, when I when I got when I saw that you know happening a few months ago, I was really inspired by that. And so I'd love if you could you know if the rest of the group doesn't know, if you could kind of expand a little bit about it. Absolutely. So I'll share my my understanding. So you're referencing the first ever picture captured of a black hole. And um, I actually watched Interstellar last week again for you know I watched it like my second time watching it. What struck me is I'm pretty sure that movie came out you know five six years ago. And uh, there's a black hole in the pic, no spoilers, but there's a black hole in the movie. And in the movie, it looks exactly like the photograph that just came out like, you know, a year ago or something. And if you think about it, you're like, how did they know exactly what a black hole would look like? And the truth is that it's not like a surprise what a black hole looks like. In fact, astronomers undoubtedly could simulate exactly what a black hole looks like. And what we often don't realize is that even when astronomers are writing proposals to get time on telescopes to do the work they're gonna do, they simulate what their data will look like because they have a pretty good sense of what the results are gonna be before they even take collect the data. To me, what the black hole image represents is an incredible application of interferometry as a technology. So interferometry has been around for a long time. It's basically combining telescopes to act as one much larger telescope. This is made famous in radio astronomy. Uh, so if you remember contact, Jody Foster is using the very large array in New Mexico. It's these 30 dishes that all act as one giant radio telescope. And that technology has continued to improve uh, decade after decade to the point where now optical telescopes can be uh, combined through interferometry, which is just insane. Literally the light waves are being combined together. And so the image of a black hole was an application of this incredible like step forward in the ability for interferometry to take pictures of things that are so tiny on our sky that they would never be able, we'd never be able to capture an image of them before. Um, one of the big limits of how much detail, the limit of how much detail you can capture in a astronomical picture, besides blurring effects of our atmosphere, is the size of your telescope. And so by combining many telescopes together, you can take very, very uh, detailed images. So while I, so again, this is like my, my, my view of that is like, it's a very exciting, like cool thing to say, we have a picture of a black hole. Although strictly speaking, it's a picture of the stuff around a black hole, right? That's like falling in. Um, like the, the advance in my view is the technology that, that made the picture possible. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Heather asked in, in the chat, um, are there uh, other astrophysics priorities that we as civilians, we'll call us, uh, don't know so much about? Uh, and and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll overlap on that question. Common misconceptions that may be out there that, that uh, uh, folks who don't spend a lot of time focused on astronomy uh, might have that you can say, you know, here's a common misconception and speak to that. So, so both of those things, the priorities and the misconceptions. You know, I would say in terms of priorities that the, what motivates the scientists is probably 10x to 100x more technical than what is presented to the public, right? Um, so the topic of, oh, you know, we're, we're trying to find life in the universe. Why are we searching for planets? Oh, it's life in the universe, right? Why are we going to Mars? It's water on Mars. It's life on Mars. Things get simplified to such a degree that I think it's sometimes this, the, the coolness of the uniqueness of the of the of the studies gets gets oversimplified out of the out of the story. Um, misconceptions. Hmm. I, have to, I, I have to think about that for a second. I mean, there's kind of like the standard misconceptions in astronomy. You know, like what causes the seasons. But misconceptions. I mean. 
I, so you're talking to someone who's not a research astronomer. Like I chose to leave a life of research to become like really focus on teaching. And so maybe that, that is, that is the, the, the lens through which all of my, my comments would be. But as I talk with friends who stayed in the research field, like honestly, the thing I hear the most from them is how frustrated they are that money is such a huge part of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, like you'd like to think that in the altruism of like the ivory towers, like in just the pursuit of knowledge, like they wouldn't have to be thinking about money so much. Um, one of my closest friends from graduate school is a, a faculty member at a, a large university. And he actually was like starting a business to fund his research. He's like, it's easier than writing these grants. He's like, I'm going to make millions of dollars from my business to support my, astro my, my astronomy research. I'm like, you're insane. But um, that's how competitive the dollars are uh, for researchers, which is, which is disappointing, I think, for many of them. All right. Well, before I hand it back to you for a final thought, uh, what we will do is we will wind down the recording. Uh, as all of you know who watch more than uh, one or two or three of these, we just keep talking to these interesting people after we stop the recording, which is why you want to get involved with, with checking out like what we do when we're doing it live, right? But if you are watching the recording as a part of the program on a future week uh, where, uh, where this is, this is our, our capstone piece of the meeting, we thank you for joining us. And we hope that you will tell us a little bit about what you thought of this program, other elements of the meeting, the inspirational video, the you know, the, the comments and happy dollars, you know, all of the different things, the learn something new piece that Shags helps us, you know, kind of enjoy every week. All of those elements are elements that, that come together to allow us to have an experience that we hope inspires you in some way each week. Leave a comment in our discuss section at the bottom. And if you are needing to make up a miss from another club's meeting, all you have to do is do the little attendance piece that is just down from this recording as well please successfully spell your email address when you do that in order to receive the necessary email to pass along to your club secretary. With that, I thank you for joining us and I wanna hand it back to Andrew for the final word. Well, first of all, thank you so much. And um, I, I think the, the final thought is one of the things I love the most about astronomy is that um, it is so accessible and there are so many books written for a pop popular level audience that can be uh, that can be read. And so um, that's how I just fell into astronomy was by reading these books. And I think you can get you can get as as deep as you'd ever want to get by a trip to the library. Honestly, fantastic, everyone. We will see you next week.